And we're live. This is Plant Daddy Podcast, serving you intersectional horticulture. I'm Matthew. And I'm Steven. So today, we are going to talk about my favorite family of plants, Orchidacea, uh, the orchids. I am sure that you're familiar with orchids, and even people who don't know many plants usually know orchids, um, but we're going to get to that later. First, Stephen, do you have any exciting updates about any of your plants? Uh, yeah, so I think I have some orchid blooms coming, actually. Um, Brassavola, um, another one that you've helped me pick out years ago. Um, I think it will be its third or fourth time blooming. Oh, Very proud awesome. of that. I have definitely mistreated this orchid in the past, so every time it blooms, that feels like a gift. And this is Brassavola nodosa. I believe it's native to Mexico. They have insanely fragrant flowers, but only at night. Um, it's one of my favorites. Mine too. So I'm actually currently waiting on my Hoya obovada to bloom. It has done that once, but I had mealybug at the time, so those flowers were a little bit marred and a lot of them dropped before they were ready to open. But right now it has two panicles that are about to burst open. Um, they have really neat flowers. They kind of like pop open and then the petals reflex and it's uh, really geometric. What kind of colors? Uh, shades of pink. Like nice. there's dark red and light pink on them. Um, they're supposed to be fragrant. I didn't notice that when it bloomed last time. So I'm really going to keep an eye out for that this time. Um, but speaking of fragrant flowers, also my hibiscus arnotianus is about to have its first flower. That is a native hibiscus of Hawaii. Um, the most common hibiscus that you see are actually native to China. That's um, hibiscus rosea sinensis. And that's the one that's been used by cultivators and hybridizers. That's uh, like the red one, the kind of classic one yeah, that people put in their hair or whatever. Red, yellow, orange, like they okay. come in tons of colors now. But this particular one, um, Hibiscus rinatianus, has white flowers. The stamen is bright red. Hmm. And they're actually supposed to be a little bit fragrant. It's a variety that they use to make lays. I have a, a friend who grew up in Hawaii and it's one of her favorite flowers. Very cool. So I started this as a cutting um, a few years ago and it's doing really well now. And so I'm gonna be flooding Instagram with photos of that oh. as soon as it's popped open. Very good. Yeah. Now, do you have any news stories about plants or, you know, other topics? You know, I put aside some this week and I've forgotten all of them. So now I feel like I need to have a like a special list for this. Uh, sadly, the only thing that comes to mind it, or comes to mind is this, you know, kind of cactus. Someone was calling a penis cactus. Uh, I oh, also you showed me a photo of yeah, that. Yeah, I also remembered seeing a breast cactus that really looked a lot like breasts. But so, then again, the penis cactus also looked a lot like a it, penis. It kind of did. Uh, so I don't really know if that's news to anyone except me. Uh, it's, I don't know if that's worthwhile news, but that's the only thing that uh, can, came to my mind. So uh, let's just move on, I guess. Do you happen to know the species of those? No, or they just... I don't want to talk about it. No, okay. I think it was, <laughs> it was so... <laughs> Someone, I think, trying to give like a phonetic, you know, spelling of the species name in there, but then didn't actually give you the species name. So I oh. was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm sure it's in this post somewhere. And then I think I was already scanning something else, you know, how, like, you know, you consume yeah. the internet. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Well, it's just shameful. Um, so let's just move on to the next point. I mean, how about you? Any news? Yeah, so I was reading about this study that was led by scientists at the University of Sheffield's Institute for Sustainable Food. This story uh, was published in National, or excuse me, in Nature Communications. And basically what they've done is they have used, you know, science techniques and genetic manipulation <laughs> to basically reveal that... The more stoma a leaf has, the more airspace it forms. So Ooh. stoma are the little pores that aid in respiration that are on a plant's leaf. And we've known that since the 19th century. Um, but it's kind of eluded us how the air channels um, function within a plant in order for it to respirate. So we now understand this intricate internal network of air channels and it turns out that basically the more stoma a leaf has, 
the more intense the internal airflow channels are. Mm. But this also means that a plant will lose more moisture through respiration. So the fewer stoma on a leaf, the less moisture that is lost to just like evaporation through respiration. So okay. we have actually inadvertently bred the wheat plant to have fewer stoma. And this wasn't done intentionally, but oh. It aids in drought hardiness because yeah, it seems like it would be intentional. Like right, you know, then it's more drought hardy, but it's unintentional. Yeah, so like we were breeding for drought hardiness, and oh. we didn't know what that mechanism was. And it turns out that in achieving drought hardy plants, we have just simply reduced the stoma in their leaves. I'm sure there's other mechanisms involved, but this particular part of that entire. Uh, uh, Thing. <laughs> mechanism yeah um it's basically a part that we haven't understood yet okay, interesting i'm taken back to like some second or third grade diagram like in a you know earth science class that had stoma and like yeah stamen and kind of things like that so well, like, and we're going to talk more about plant parts back. later okay yeah um but basically this just has a lot of uh opportunity to create more climate uh mm. resistant plants as our climate becomes more unpredictable and drier so it <sighs> is potentially yeah. like a really good opportunity for plants in agriculture to be more productive than they have That'd been be interesting yeah so that was my story that's basically what i thought was cool this week um so it's not news per se but we do want to share that Plant Daddy Podcast can now also be found on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest as Plant Daddy Podcast, and also online at plantdaddypodcast.com. And we're going to be posting videos and tutorials to YouTube, including a brief video about repotting and mounting Phalaenopsis orchids from this episode. Uh, but, uh, Stephen, anything you want to talk about before we launch into orchids? Um, you know... No, not really. I would say overall, um, I think I relate to this experience that you were talking about when we were talking about doing this episode, which is like, you know, we encounter orchids so often now. We encounter them in the grocery store, in these sort of daily places, right? Maybe in, you know, your mom's bathroom, like yeah. in my case, like growing <laughs> shockingly well. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to to hear more about these. I've had mixed success with orchids myself. Um, I have kind of like I normally do, I'll try something really hard and rare with no, you know, documentation anywhere. And I've also had um, some Trader Joe's or orchids gifted to me. So kind of the range of experiences, but it'll be good to hear something cohesive. Mine was a lot, my experience and my tries were very sort of scattershot. So looking well, forward to it. And Stephen and I both really like the Seattle Orchid, which is a local company here. Because they offer a variety of both ornamental, flowering, like florist type orchids, as well as some really bizarre, strange, exotic ones. And so, of course, while I'm gravitating towards fragrant white orchids, Stephen is like picking out the tiny ones that they don't even have a species name. And... Yeah, that comes <laughs> riddled with frogs um, that they're like, oh, look, this uh, can't, here it's in this back cabinet. Um, they have this showroom that you can visit, I think, during some. It's, it's kind of limited hours, but it is very cool. They let you just kind of come into the uh, their workspace. So. Yeah. So his, his orchids are strange and unique, and I'm far less discerning. So let's get back to orchids. The ones that most people are familiar with are, of course, the varieties that are usually found at grocery stores. And these include the Phalaenopsis, which is just that classic uh, white, pink, sometimes purple or green orchid. Uh, they're also called moth orchids. There are also Uncidium, which have many small yellow flowers. Dendrobiums, which may be pink, white. They can have long arching sprays of flowers. They can also have clusters of them along their stems. Cattleya, which are the variety you see in corsages. It's kind of the quintessential classic orchid. Paphiopetalum, the slipper orchids that are very, very beautiful in shades of green and purple. They always look particularly exotic. Miltonia and Milanopsis, often called pansy orchids because they have large flat faces that sort of resemble pansies. And there's of course others, but these are some of the most common. 
So of these, I mean, I think people think of the moth orchid as sort of that quintessential sort of two-cheeked looking kind yeah. of oval-ish, you know, often white, often purple. Mm -hmm. One that you see at, I mean, Trader Joe's is most places, Trader Joe's. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, just, so, just so people... So people most of this episode is going to focus on that particular one because even though the orchid genuses are very diverse... Um, as a plant family, a lot of them are not really going to be ideal for growing indoor spaces. So we're only going to really focus on the ones that are going to thrive in your home. And for a lot of growers, the Phalaenopsis is the top of that list. So these are just a few of the 763 genuses in the orchid family. And they're represented by about 28,000 species, which make it one of the largest two taxonomical plant families, numbering between 6 to 11 percent of all seed plants. So, you know, a lot of the existing plants <laughs> this are gonna orchids. This is going to be a 45-hour episode. Yeah. Okay, so tuck in. Yep. Um, get yourself comfortable. Right. Bring popcorn. <laughs> what makes it uh, such a diverse family uh, largely has to do with the fact that they can be found on every continent besides Antarctica. They grow in almost every type of biome. They include some of the smallest flowering plants, and there are also some that can become enormous individuals or very large colonies or even vines. Basically, there's an orchid for every situation. And Wikipedia tells me that there are as many bony fish species as there are orchid species, twice the number of birds, and around four times the number of mammals. This is something you should mention at every dinner party for the rest of your life. Yeah, make all of your friends love you and yeah. respect how smart you are. <laughs> so to compare, the other family that is considered the largest, Asteraceae, the daisy family, has almost 33,000 species and almost 1,200 genera. But as is always the way with taxonomy, there's a lot of confusion and disagreement about how to split species, how to group them within genuses, and a lot of orchid growers are very familiar with the scientific restructuring of these, and there have been many significant changes in how well-known plants have been classified over time. So one plant may, by, may go by multiple species names or in multiple genera, and there has always been, of course, one currently recognized name for each plant, but because some of them have been in cultivation for so long uh, under currently incorrect genera or species that they may just go by their obsolete name for the practicality of consistency. And this is especially when they're used in hybridization and the historical names that are used in the parentage of modern plant hybrids. So a classic example of this are a group of Cattleya orchids that used to be known as the Brazilian Lelias. Lelia yeah. is a related genus of Cattleya, but there were some different uh, di differences in the flower anatomy that led them to group these several Brazilian Lelia species as unique. But we have recently been able to determine with genetic uh, data that they're yeah. actually still a cat like, no you're not special we... yeah they are still special actually like a couple of those are my favorite orchids like uh lelia purpurea which is now better known as Calia purpurea but so basically what you're saying too is like all right there will be lots of arguments even amongst experienced growers scientists right so if you yeah. ever bring it up expect to be attacked yeah like if you walk into a room and talk about your brazavola digbiana everyone who is in the know will scoff at you and know that it's actually Rhyncholalia digbiana. Maybe, yeah, maybe you want to be attacked. Maybe you like attention. Yeah. So you're but welcome. so this is one more way to get yeah. attention, is what we're saying. Mm -hmm. So what defines an orchid? Because obviously, it's a very plant group, and there are some things though that make it very easy to tell if something is an orchid, and they all share these specific traits. So. These are largely based on the flowers. The flowers are bilaterally symmetrical, and they're comprised of three sepals and three petals. One of the petals, it's typically the one pointing downwards, kind of in the six o'clock position. This has been highly modified into a lip, uh, which is also called a labellum. And this is frequently the most ornate and decorative part of the flower. And it often obscures or covers the fused stamen and carpal. This is the reproductive structure. It is called a column or a gymnadrium, 
And the anther, uh, which is part of this, is usually found uh, in, in kind of this little tucked away area with pollen grains that are held together in a structure called a polina. These are waxy masses of pollen grains. And what happens is that these are released onto a pollinator, usually an insect, that brushes up against a sticky filament known as a visidium, and this hangs off of the pollina, sticks to the insect, so that the insect can then carry the pollina to the next flower, where it will hopefully get stuck to the stigma of the second flower in order to pollinate it. The stigma is a sticky area behind the anther um, in this column, so it definitely takes a little bit of uh, trouble for an orchid plant to oh. get pollinated when it has that specific of a reproductive mechanism. Yeah, and so if you're looking for images, you should just Google Georgia O'Keeffe. Okay. And this you'll will see some really up close <laughs> photos, diagrams. paintings. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. So there's also a lot of really interesting examples of orchids that have co-evolved alongside a pollinator, alongside a primary pollinator, to the point where only one insect species actually pollinates a particular orchid. And one of the best known of these is Engrequium sesquid sesquipedale. Um, uh, it's also called the Darwin orchid, and this okay. plant is from Madagascar. It was discovered while Darwin was alive, but its pollinator was unknown. And Darwin posited that because of the flower's fragrance, its large white uh, shape, and this very long nectar spur that kind of sticks out the back of the flower, that it was probably pollinated by a night-flying insect and that it was going to be one that had a proboscis, like butterflies and moths have, that was at least 12 inches long in order to reach the nectar at the wow. back of the spur. And no insect was known at that time that fit this description. And so Darwin basically was like, one day we're going to discover that there's a moth that pollinates this night pollinated plant. And sure enough, um, Basically, that insect that he described without having ever encountered it uh, was discovered. So this is usually called the Darwin orchid, and I happen to have one, but it hasn't bloomed for me. Um, they're, they're really beautiful. They are a monopetal orchid, which we will talk about later. So with all of these really specialized pollination adaptations, the flowers tend to remain receptive to pollination for a very long time, which is necessary if you can't just count on any insect to help you set seeds. If you're only waiting for one particular one to come along, it behooves you as a flower to keep yourself like hmm. up for business for yeah. the longest amount of time possible so that you have the best opportunity of pollination. Now, what this means for us as growers is that it has really helped establish their popularity as an ornamental plant for home growers because they hold their blossoms for weeks and sometimes even months. And a plant in bloom is a joy to have for much longer than like, you know, a poppy, which blooms and all the petals fall off the next day. Mm -hmm. Or hibiscus, yeah. who bloom once and then the or, flower you know, falls off. Like some, you know, cactus plant you'll have that will bloom at night for one hour. And yeah. And you might, you know, be gone. It's really nice that orchids <laughs> don't do this. Uh, that isn't all of them, though. There are some orchids that have very short-lived flowers. Um, I grow this one particular species called Sobralia. Um, I don't remember its species name, but her flowers only last for one day, so you really have to appreciate them when they're there. This is definitely, though, not the, the typical length that an orchid flower will last. So after a flower is pollinated, it will fade prematurely, having served its purpose. A fruit will form from the ovary of the flower, which is the portion of stem directly behind the sepals. This will swell into a capsule and will house up to a million seeds. And in order to fit almost a million seeds, they need to be entirely like microscopic, basically. So when the capsule ripens and bursts open, these nearly microscopic seeds are then released into the air like dust. And indeed, they're that small because they lack an endosperm, which stores food for a plant embryo. So in order to germinate, an orchid embryo has to enter into a symbiotic relationship with certain fungi 
And wow. these fungi are then able to provide these precious nutrients required for germination. Because the seeds dispersed by air have a very low chance of encountering these fungi, only a very small number of seeds actually become adult plants. And, and really, this is just, I mean, we're talking about how this works in nature. Yeah. This is not something anyone does still, really, right? Well, it's um, interesting that you should bring that up because orchids were extremely expensive when they first became popular because nobody knew how to grow them from seed. And it was this yeah. huge mystery because they could produce seeds, but they weren't able to actually get them to germinate and grow. Mm -hmm. And they had no idea kind of what mechanisms were behind the germination of them. Um, so orchid growers in the 19th century, uh, a lot of them were among the first to encounter many of the exotic species of the neotropics, like the Cattleya that I keep talking about. And as they began to receive scientific description and enter the European plant market, not being able to propagate a new plant from seed meant that you were really only able to offer wild collected or divisions of wild collected plants. And since orchids are so slow growing, if you're relying entirely on like plants that you are collecting out of a rainforest, that can have devastating consequences. Of course, they didn't really care much about um, ecology back then. Yeah. So there were tons of orchids taken from rainforests, but it was really difficult to grow enough to satisfy the demand. So the first successes in growing orchids from seed actually just came basically from an accident. A grower discovered that there were seedlings germinating in the planting medium of, a, of established mature plants and the fact that these seeds just inadvertently ended up there was kind of a miracle because it showed them that there was something going on um, environmentally that aided mm -hmm. the germination that none of their techniques had used. So they began to actually just use old potting mix that, unbeknownst to them, already had some of those fungi that were helping to produce uh, nutrition for the orchid embryos. So once they were able to basically like unlock this idea, mm -hmm. modern techniques basically involve sowing the seeds into an artificial nutrient medium in flasks. So this is like agar and it has, you know, fungus inhibitors, but also carbohydrates and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you basically just grow these little like embryonic plants until the seedlings are large enough that they can be individually potted and support themselves on their own roots. They're very delicate in this stage, but by unlocking the potential for seed propagation, basically like we created a huge opportunity for hybridization and that has yielded plants that were basically easier and hardier to grow. Um, yeah. If you're able to mix like desirable traits from some plants, mm -hmm. you might get you know, the flower color of one, the leaves. Or some flower spike with like 39, you know, flowers that will stay there for weeks. Yeah, but but you're also bringing into the equation, like if one plant can tolerate temperatures down to like 60 degrees and the other plant can tolerate temperatures down to 40 degrees, you're increasing its hardiness. And so then Trader Joe's can put it right next to, you know, the cheese. Yeah. Right? Or right in their front Just doorway right where there's a lot of wind currents, which orchids don't like. So basically every orchid that you encounter at a grocery store is a hybridized cultivar and their low prices indicate that they are easy to propagate and grow quickly in a greenhouse setting. And that's how they've really been able to become as common and affordable as any other ornamental plants. And their care requirements are just slightly more specialized than your average foliage plant by this point. So another unique characteristic of orchids is their growth habit. All orchids are perennial herbs, which means that they have no woody structures. There are two patterns of growth for orchids, monopedial and sympodial. So the Phalaenopsis is, is an example of a monopedial orchid. I think that literally means one foot. Um, and this is a reference to how they have one active growth point. These also um, are typically all similar looking orchids. So like Vandas and the Angricum that I talked about earlier, these are also monopedial, 
But vanilla, which for those of you who don't know, is an orchid. Uh, that oh, wow. one, yep, it, it, it grows as a vine, and this is also a monopodial orchid. Okay. These orchids have a single growth point with new leaves produced alternatingly from the apex of the stem, which forms a fan-like shape. Some of these orchids remain really short with only a few leaves, like the Phalaenopsis, and their leaves completely hide the stem. Or you might have one that grows many leaves at once on longer stems, which are sometimes even visible. And these can reach several meters in length, like Vanda's or the vining vanilla species. The more kind of typical orchid growth, though, is called sympodial. And these plants have like a front and a back. Oncidium, oh. Cattleya, Sim, uh, Miltonia, Dendrobium, most of these are all of this growth type. And their habit is to grow new foliage from creeping rhizomes, which are a portion of stem that they produce roots from. Most sympodial orchids have a modified stem structure that's called a pseudobulb. And this is a thickened stem, and basically it can be either between one leaf node, or like between two leaf nodes basically for one segment, or it can be composed of several internodes. And some of these that you're going to be the most familiar with, if you've seen an Oncidium orchid, they have those large round uh, fleshy bases. That's a really classic example. So if there is only one node that is swollen, this is called heteroblastic. If it has multiple nodes that are swollen, this is homoblastic. Okay, this is explaining some plants that I have right now. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> where I thought some of the balls, I'm like, why do I keep losing them? But what? there's one, okay. Yeah, so All right. the way that these function is, uh, basically to be able to serve as storage vessels. They contain nutrients and water for dry seasons. So having pseudobulbs is kind of a little key to a grower about what kinds of conditions that the plant likes. If it has really well-defined bulbs, that means that it's going to experience periods of dryness. And if it doesn't have any, that probably means that it's not going to experience periods of dryness. So a lot of the monopodial orchids, without having the specialized uh, vessel, they don't want to dry out very much, and they want to stay pretty moist consistently throughout the year. Whereas when you look at Cattleya, Oncidium, Cymbidium, um, all of these are ones that are specialized to have a period where they don't have as much access to water. So typically, all of the leaves and flowers come from this structure. A heteroblastic pseudobulb of one single internode produces leaves and flowers from the top, while homoblastic pseudobulbs may have the leaves along its length and flower from nodes along the pseudobulb itself. The modified leaves that form a sheath for developing pseudobulbs will often encircle it entirely or even just partially, and these become dry and papery as they die. They just basically serve as a protective covering. The orchids will grow a new pseudobulb from shoots that appear at the base of mature growth, and it may grow one or several new leads at once while in active growth. But because these new growth tend to grow mature flower and then produce the next growth, the orchid will sometimes appear to creep along the surface. As you have the newest front growth that's brand new, the older back growth, which is older, and over time, these will shed their leaves and eventually wither. When they are still intact and healthy, but have shed their leaves, they're usually called back bulbs. And you can mm. trim these off and dormant buds at the base of the rhizomes uh, may begin to sprout and you can propagate plants that way. Huh, okay. So because they, um, they have this particular growth habit, um, they usually have a cycle of active, active growth and then a rest period. And the blooming may occur before or after the rest period, depending on the plant. And understanding these cycles is crucial for a happy orchid that reblooms in your care. Some sympodial orchids don't have pseudobulbs, like the slipper orchids, Pathiopetalum. Their growth pattern is superficially similar to monopedial plants like Phalaenopsis. Um, they also grow in warm and consistently moist environments. So this means that they have no need for that extra storage. So their stem is very short and completely hidden within several leaves that are held in a fan-like shape. Each growth will, will basically mature 
bloom if you're lucky, and then produce new growth from the side, which form large clumps over time. Some orchids, like Sobralia and Epidendrum, grow reed-like stems that may be considered homoblastic, but they don't have the swollen appearance. So you'll often see these discussed as not having pseudobulbs. Hmm. Regardless of the growth pattern, though, orchids actually exist in the wild in many different ways. Some are terrestrial, growing in the ground and soil, like most plants, or in rich forest detritus in their native homes. But the most well-known orchids are almost all epiphytic. So not to, be not, not to be confused with a parasite, an epiphyte is a plant that grows on another, usually a tree, but without harming the host. In a tropical rainforest, there's such a high level of competition for resources that orchids have joined many other epiphytes among the branches of trees, because this basically gives better access to light, air movement, better positions for seed dispersal, and it allows them to make use of space that's unsuitable for other plants, so they're in less competition for those resources. Many tropical foliage plants actually grow as epiphytes in the wild, and we will usually um, see them in pots because it's much easier to grow potted plants indoors. And we're going to have an episode where we talk more about this and the specific growth habit because the adaptation for growing among forest canopies does create certain challenges for home growers. Um, and if you're interested in ferns, bromeliads, philodendrons, and more, like, this is an episode for you. So, when you're growing as an epiphyte, specifically in a tree, or as a lithophyte, growing on rocks, the, ro <clears throat> the roots take on a different form and function. For the typical plant that just grows in the ground, roots are meant to anchor themselves, draw in water and nutrients, and sometimes spread to form colonies, and while terrestrial plants have many mechanisms for tolerating dryness or wetness, epiphytes are a little bit pickier. Their roots take up nutrients in water, but one of their key responsibilities is actually just to anchor the plant securely to its site. Many orchids have comparatively few roots, and these are usually thick, fleshy, and sometimes brittle. They may also grow aerial roots in order to extract humidity from the air, uh, but serve like offering no support function. Yeah, and I would just say, like, as somebody who, you know, just tried growing an orchid or two, this took me a long time, I think, to understand. I think I then was reading about it as well, and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, they don't have to be in the ground, but then it's like, wait, what are they actually doing? And yeah, they they function so differently, and I feel like my understanding is still a little bit limited, right? But yeah, like, you you know, they're absorbing so much, they're storing a lot, like you're saying, they're anchoring, yeah. they're not just in there, you know, in a pot trying to spread and spread and spread, and y anyway, yeah, yeah. keep going. They, they are doing that, but, like, in the wild, they're just trying to, like, securely hold a plant onto its tree. Um, they're, basically, there's a, a core in the center that's covered with a spongy tissue called velamen, and this helps the plant absorb atmospheric moisture. When they are dry, a lot of orchid roots are white, silvery, gray, or brown, but when they become wet, this kind of goes away as the outer reflective surface dulls and they darken to show that water is being absorbed. Now, many terrestrial orchids have corms or tubers or some other underground structure to help the plant deal with seasonal heat, cold, dryness, or other stresses, kind of somewhere in the way that pseudobulbs support epiphytic orchids. But basically all orchids are fairly picky about the amount of moisture and air around their root systems, even if they're one that grows in cold, hardy climates. Um, imagine like where the plant grows in order to help you understand how to treat it best. A Phalaenopsis uh, grows in tropical Southeast Asia. They come from kind of low areas and forest canopy that has fairly consistent low light, high moisture, and warm temperatures year-round. But their roots are completely exposed to the elements, so they may get rained on multiple times a day. And with open air around, they basically dry rapidly and re-moisten rapidly. It's a pretty consistent experience for a plant to be soaked multiple times a day. The roots, uh, when you put them in a pot though, need to be treated differently. So in the wild, they'll often usually hang with their growth point angled in a way that doesn't collect water because this will facilitate rot. 
And for a monopedial orchid, damaging this growing point is usually fatal to the orchid as they don't have a store of dormant buds waiting at the base of pseudobulbs to activate as needed. So when we grow them indoors, it's, it's almost never hanging upside down from a branch, getting watered several times a day with like really high atmospheric humidity. So instead, we put them in pots, root side down, and now they're at risk of water collecting in the growth points and the roots, roots may suffocate. Additionally, a lot of homes are far drier than tropical jungles, so there's a big difference also in the light levels wanted by low light plants compared with what like our human specific idea of brightness is in our room. So how do we succeed with these plants in such a different setting yeah. than their environment. Yeah, and I think it's important to sort of dispense with some of your expectations just about growing, you know, I don't know, daisies in a terracotta pot or whatever, right, that you think. And I... You'll probably be successful with daisies really? in a pot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did, the, oh, no, but I'm saying growing these just like that. Yes, yeah, you know that, I mean? that like, won't happen. Yeah, I, I think... It took me a while to, I think, shed those expectations, kind of, or being like, oh, I have to question this as well. I'm like, wait, I'm not overwatering? Uh, you know, anyway. So. Yeah. Well, conveniently, Phalaenopsis are pretty hardy and adaptable, and they are able to tolerate lower humidity and survive getting too dry without much damage. But after the blooms fade, it's really just a plant with large floppy leaves that sort of look like beaver tails. So... Because the flowers are the primary reason to grow most orchids, we want them to thrive well enough to rebloom and do this reliably instead of just clinging to a pitiful existence, which I think is what a lot of Phalaenopsis do if they're lucky enough to make it past blooming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the key factors to get your Phalaenopsis to rebloom, though, basically come down to root health and sufficient water and sufficient light. So let's start with how you get one into your life. The first thing that you need to do is either be gifted one or go pick one out yourself. And the, the things... Thank God for this. Yeah, like that's... <laughs> we're, we're really giving you important information that you won't wow. get anywhere else. You're welcome. Yeah. What you want to look for are healthy, bright green, unblemished leaves. The crown where the leaves come from should appear firm and plump with no signs of dark blotches or yellowing. These could both indicate rot. Roots should be fairly plump and thick, silvery white to green, uh, silvery white to gray, I mean, with green tips indicating active growth. I always look for a plant with about half of the flowers open so that it gives immediate impact uh, and looks beautiful. But I also ensure that there's going to be a long time before the last flower fades if I still have a few buds that are left to open. So if you see some buds, right, and I know you're not looking at these, but say mm -hmm. like half have bloomed, how much like runway, I guess, would you expect? Like, oh, these will continue to open for the next week? Um, or is it, it just... It kind of depends a lot. Depends. Like if, if the buds themselves are looking very round and full, they're close to opening. If they're mm. more tight and a little bit on the green side, that means that they're going to take longer. So you'll typically, you know, if your orchid has half of its flowers open, those have probably been blooming for about a week already. You might have another week to two weeks before they're fully open. Okay. And then once the whole plant is in bloom, It'll hold those for like four to six weeks, probably. Yeah, it's insanely long. Yeah, like you can have a plant with multiple spikes that are blooming that's consistently in bloom for like a whole season, okay. um, which is why they're so popular because they're absolutely beautiful for very long periods of time, and they're pretty hardy when you bring them home and treat them well. Um, one of the things that you need to do when you first get it home is to inspect the roots and the planting medium. You should water it if it's dry. They're often dry at the grocery store. Um, the, the best way to water is just in a sink. You can flood the pot a few times to make sure that it's thoroughly saturated, but you always want to let the excess water drain away so that the roots are never sitting in water. Um, this is a really good way to rot them. And Phalaenopsis tend to be a little bit more forgiving on this than some other species. But it's just never good to leave orchids sitting in water. So, and I've heard this too, just um, 
you know, because it, it will get, it can seem strange to water a plant, have all the water just rush away, right? Because maybe you're used to like, oh, well, the soil is moist in some other type of plant. And then, yeah. you know, so this plant could continue to drink, right? So in this case, it can't. I've heard this trick where, you know, you can look at roots like this and it's like, all right, this orchid is watered when the roots have turned from silver to green. And this seems like for some of these species that that's a good judge, but then for some species, right, it just doesn't look that way. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, most of the orchids that I grow, the roots definitely darken when you water. I know that that's not true for all of them, but if you're saturating a plant well enough that the roots darken, um, it's drying in water. The best way to make sure that your substrate is like thoroughly watered so that every area of root has access to some is just to flood the pot really well because you're not gonna be able to see the roots that are hidden yeah um you just want to make sure that they are also getting the same access to water if you just go around and use a mist bottle to spray the surface of your orchid pots sure those roots will darken but that doesn't mean that most of the roots are getting watered that's just a good indication though if you've yeah. given you know, some amount of moisture to that root. If one of them is particularly white and glistening, you mm -hmm. know, that it doesn't have yeah, water or, or on it's, it. Or maybe just to get a sense of how they drink, right? Like how these fundamentally different kinds of roots function. Yeah. Um, it's just, yeah, I mean, mist it. And then just watch their root colors change as they sort of absorb that water. And yeah. Maybe, I mean, for me, I felt like that was kind of, you know, edifying, I guess, at first to be like, oh, this really is a different kind of mechanism. Okay. And, and they'll also take in some water through their leaves, I believe. I, I don't know much about this, but I know that hosing plants down, specifically in a greenhouse space, it really mimics the natural rainfall. It keeps them clean. It helps remove dust and like fertilizer residue from leaves. Um, a lot of growers like to use very dilute fertilizer as a spray because it can be absorbed by both the foliage and also the roots. So the key with, with most of these plants is just to make sure that you are not keeping them sopping wet. They love to get wet, but they don't love to stay wet. So once your orchid is home and it's beautifully covered in blooms, you just need to sit back and enjoy her. Like she's not gonna wanna be bothered while blooming. And if you do something like repotting while she's in flower, she might go ahead and like dramatically abort the flower buds that aren't open yet. Um, this is called bud blast. And mm -hmm. it's kind of exasperating because a lot of plants are pretty resilient to this, but orchids are not. Before they open, the buds may turn yellow, they may wither or desiccate and then fall off. And this is something that happens pretty easily um low humidity letting the plants dry too much keeping them too wet putting them in a drafty spot letting them get too hot or too cold too much sun or too little sun so the best thing to do is just to pick a bright spot that's near a window without any direct sunlight and keep the phalaenopsis watered enough that it never fully dries and then realistically right like this could just happen a time or two right as you get yeah. a sense in your space because like you're saying, okay, you picked this, you know, this plant where the flower spike has half the flowers open. You want the rest of these buds to open. Okay, you don't maybe necessarily know what your space is. Is this dry for an orchid? Is this too sunny? You have to just try it and you might lose those buds. Well, and you also have to keep in mind that that plant is probably in shock because it has been growing in a yeah. perfectly... Next to that cheese case. Okay, so... <laughs> well, that's where it's been most recently. Like, that before is... that, it was in a greenhouse, then it was put in a box, then it was put in a shipping container. Like, there's so... all of these, like, environmental traumas that a plant goes through to get from its greenhouse to your, you know, coffee table. Yeah, so we should not beat ourselves up, I guess that's yeah. what I'm saying. Um, um, it is very un unlikely that you'll retain every unopened bud on a phalaenopsis. Yeah. Um, but, right, as you get a sense of your space and what these like, I bet you, but you'll be able to find that spot, maybe with your second or third yeah. plant, if you can't with your first. But this is also a reason why I don't pick up orchids that have, like, one open flower and then 15 buds left, because I might only have, like, three flowers that open if I buy it in a particularly dry period, oh. or if I walk from Trader Joe's to my apartment on a day that's 50 degrees and it gets too chilled. Oh, wow. So, okay. like, they can be pretty sensitive. Um, 
I don't want you to feel scared though because this is just kind of part of the deal and you can minimize it as much as you can. So basically you just want to do your best and it'll be fine. So regardless of whether or not bud blast prematurely ended your flowers or you just let nature do its thing and the flowers have naturally faded and fallen off, this is a great time to repot your plant. The first thing that you're going to want to do is clip the flower spike back. Don't clip it all the way off. Hmm. You can if you want, but there are dormant buds that are underneath the kind of papery uh, nodes along the length. And if you trim the orchid spike back just below the, the first flower that it grew, you are preserving these nodes that then may decide to like waken and you'll get more flowers off of that spike eventually. So the spike will like continue, it will extend again kind of? Yeah, it'll like grow from there. it'll That's grow same. some branches and then bloom. Oh wow. This isn't guaranteed. There are some species of Phalaenopsis that do this really readily in the wild and they are used in hybridization so white orchids don't always tend to do this because oh. the white phalaenopsis don't tend to have as much of that parentage in them um some of the smaller uh like more colorful flowers um that are less you know large and round like the typical ones mm -hmm. those ones tend to have a really high chance of spiking again from the the existing one um it's always worth doing you might be surprised um okay but yeah so that's the first thing to do then you're gonna want to start unpotting your orchid the roots are designed to cling to a surface of course so it can sometimes be uh, kind of a challenge to unpot the orchid. It's going to be clinging to the inside. So you can give yourself a little bit of uh, success by watering it thoroughly, like maybe an hour before you're going to try to unpot it. And this will help to loosen the root system and allow it to separate carefully. You're going to gently tease the roots apart and often they will have circled the inside of the pot and they may even be growing through the drainage holes. So this may be a little challenging, but take your time and don't be afraid to trim any roots that are stopping you from being able to release the plant from the pot. So uh, would you water it before you do this? Yeah, um, yeah. Soak the... The, the, the roots will be a little bit more flexible and a little bit less brittle. And the way that they attach themselves to the inside of the, the pot um, it's usually easier to loosen them okay. so that you're not breaking or damaging roots. Right. Since they have fewer roots than a lot of other plants, it's good to be as gentle as you can and damage them as little as possible. So once you have separated the pot and the plant, I will just swish the root ball around in a bowl of water or in the sink. And what this does is it helps to release the substrate from the roots, you don't want to retain any of the old substrate. And a lot of the orchids that you'll buy, it'll be a combination of sphagnum moss or bark, but you just want to get rid of it all and gently remove it from roots that are attached to nuggets of bark, um, pull off the sphagnum, and then you can begin to assess what the root ball looks like. If the roots are particularly balled up, you'll just want to work gently to loosen them, uncoil them, um, and you're looking for any roots that are brown, any that are like squishy, that don't have a firm texture to them, broken ones, desiccated roots that are dry and papery, and... Uh, you know, I, or I've found, I mean, I don't have as much Phalaenopsis uh, experience for sure, but... If you've just swished it around, right, you'll kind of see the roots that are still absorbing some water, right? Because mm -hmm. you'll know, like, oh, there's green, there's that little bit of color change. If there's none, that's, you know, typically dead, right? Yeah. Like it's not even functioning. Some orchids just have brown roots, like Paphiopetalum. So, you know, don't trim all those off if they're brown. But for a Phalaenopsis, you should be able to see what a healthy root looks like. It's silvery grayish it turns kind of a dark greenish color when it's wet. Mm -hmm. The ones that are damaged 
um, will probably look like a healthy root, but there may be like a snapped portion where the velamen is broken, even if the core is intact. Okay. Um, rotted roots are going to be brown if they're older. They may just be like kind of a papery layer over the core, um, very loose, and you can just kind of pull it off or trim it off. Mm -hmm. um, roots that have recently rotted will be actually squishy. You should be able to tell the texture of a healthy root by like if you just pitch it gently, does it give? If yes, then it's rotted. If no, then it's healthy. So what you want to do is to give it a, a root trim. Um, we have the ability to really carefully pull these roots apart, cut off any of the ones that are dead, of course, cut off any of the ones that are rotted, and any that are broken, just trim them back so that you're cutting through the core between the broken portion um, and any that are like super long. They're not gonna grow new roots out of their, their sides very easily if they're that long. So you can encourage it to branch its roots by trimming the long ones to like five to eight inches or so. Huh. So when you're finished, you'll have a tidy, clean plant that only has healthy roots and none of them will be super long. So now what do you do with it? You have a couple of options. Um, the most common one is just to pot it. And what you want to look for in a pot, um, there are some choices that are going to depend on how you're growing them. You definitely have seen um, orchids in clay pots at the grocery store. These have a plastic liner on the inside that the plant is actually planted in and then the clay pot has no drainage holes. Um, you can use the same pot that you have already used, just wash it well and then put it directly back the way that you found it. You can use clay, uh, plastic, the clay pots can be glazed or unglazed, but the goal is to pick a pot that's going to do what you're looking for. Uh, you want to keep the Phalaenopsis to be fairly moist at all times. So if you water really heavily, plastic is going to retain water and so will glazed clay pots. But if you tend to be really light on your watering, um, you're not going to want to do something like unglazed clay or those special orchid pots that have holes in the side because that'll facilitate drying. So, so yeah, I would say, you know, what you're saying here, right, is, hey, do you water a lot? Are you gushing it with water? Okay, well then maybe go with those pots that have the holes, right? That yeah. Let the water out, which, you know, it's, so it's going to be moist anyway. You're watering it a ton, but you don't want it sitting in that water, like we were saying. Yeah. Most of the grocery store ones come in those enclosed pots, because I think they, they assume, like, hmm, these people are not going to keep these plants quite moist enough, right? Yeah. So let's enclose and trap everything that these, you know, people put maybe from their ice cubes or whatever they're doing. Um, so really it depends. Yeah. I mean, are you watering every day? Are you watering every other day? Then holes. If you're not going to remember that, then maybe the enclosed. Yeah. That... Basically just like Steven's saying, pick the pot that's going to be the best for your approach. If you water a lot, get yeah. it to dry I mean, Maybe fast. this is right by your sink. You always remember to water it or maybe it isn't. Yeah. So make that choice. It's going to depend on your growing space. I personally tend to prefer clay pots um, because then I can soak them and then the clay absorbs some of that water and it dries quickly and that works for me. But this will be different for other people. So the next question is what kind of medium are you going to use? There are a lot of different options and they're kind of all fine. Um, the most common one is fir bark. And this is a good choice because it's sustainable. It's easy to, to find in any garden center. You can get large chunks or you can get fine chunks. And what it does is absorb just enough water, but it doesn't pack in very tightly against itself. So you have a lot of ability for airflow and for fast drainage. Typically, the thicker the roots of your orchid, the larger the substrate you want to use. So use something very coarse with a Phalaenopsis with its thick fleshy roots. But with an Oncidium that has delicate thin ones, 
that fine texture means that it's going to want a fine fur bark. Now, oh, so were you going to say something? Um, you know, yeah, maybe this is coming and you can just stop me, but yeah, this is that same kind of equation that we're sort of talking about, right? Or an equation, but this idea, mm -hmm. right, that, okay, these roots are often exposed. You know, these are epiphytes, right? So in this soil, yeah, maybe with the bigger root, you want the bigger chunks because there's still some air that can be in there too, right? There's yeah. drainage. It, you know, it can be exposed to that air. And, you, you know, you hear often, oh, are the roots getting enough air for your orchid? Right. Yeah. So maybe maybe this is something you touch on later, but okay, for oncidium, like you're saying, if it's a more fine root, okay, well, there are still, you know, air pockets for these finer roots in a finer, you know, grain, so to speak, bark. Yeah. And I'm I'm gonna talk more about this as well. But knowing that these are all organic media that are going to break down over time and stop being as light and fluffy they'll become more water retentive as they rot. Like, you, you also need to think about that side of the equation. Phalaenopsis don't mind being repotted every year or every two years. So if you use really coarse fur bark and you repot every two years, it'll be broken down a bit, but it's not going to be like total mush in the bottom of the pot, which would mm -hmm. kill your orchid. Uh, if you use a really fine fur bark with your oncidiums, and since they like to stay pretty moist as well. There's more surface area on the small pieces of bark. They rot more quickly. They'll degrade more quickly. And degrading uh, substrate will also change its pH. So that can throw a plant off. Mm -hmm. It can absorb more fertilizer. There's a lot of problems. So you'll typically have good luck by using uh, various additives to mix into your substrate. So some of these include uh, long fiber sphagnum moss or horticultural charcoal or coarse perlite and the benefit of these items is that they will help to uh, kind of adjust the parameters that you're trying to achieve charcoal will absorb uh, stuff out of the the pot help keep the ph stable it will also not break down over time so as your fur bark degrades you still have coarse chunks of charcoal. The perlite will do the same, helping to create uh, airiness even as the mixture is breaking down. Uh, it'll prolong the amount of time that you have before you have to repot, before the orchid roots have started to suffer. I think kind of an interesting thing here too is like you're looking for these orchid soils. You can really see the components, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so many soils you buy, you're like, oh, you have to look. Uh, what percentage pea? Like, it looks kind of peaty. Uh, is there yeah. sand in here? I mean, the orchids, you know, you really know, I feel like, what you're getting in these orchid soils, which I think is kind of, yeah. you know, makes it shopping for that easier, right? Once you know what you look what you're looking it, for. And you can buy bags that are just straight perlite, just straight fur bark, just straight charcoal. You can buy pre-mixed ones. I tend to mix my own just because I want to be able to like specifically get exactly what I want each time. So I just buy the raw ingredients, mm -hmm. but there's nothing wrong with buying something that's pre-mixed. Yeah, that's, that's probably, totally fine. You know, if, you know, if this is kind of geared towards beginners, maybe, yeah, if you're a beginner, yeah, just buy something off the shelf yeah. and see what you need to modify. You're like, oh, this is staying way too wet, staying, you know, it's not wet enough. You can yeah. amend well, it. When you're adding sphagnum moss to a mix, unlike with charcoal or perlite, those absorb amounts of water but they keep light and airy the sphagnum moss starts out light and airy but it breaks down really quickly because it just does that it's what it does and that can be on one hand great if you want to grow uh orchid that likes to stay pretty moist it holds a ton of water it stays fluffy for a period so you can use that as a potting substrate and you'll probably come across Phalaenopsis orchids that are grown in pure sphagnum moss. But because it breaks down so quickly, you do have to repot that orchid much more readily. And so this is something I think we hear most often with orchids, right? It's like, oh, this substrate is breaking down. The soil is breaking down. Again, with, you know, your daisy in your pot, no one's talking about that, right? Yeah. And I mean, what do you think of this, Matthew? So what I've heard... I've kind of heard this described as like, 
Well, you think about the orchid in the wild, right? It's typically growing on living things. It's growing on a living tree. It's mm -hmm. growing, you know, in some moss that is, you know, half alive or something. So when we put it in this dead soil, it's not used to that degradation. It's not used to the fur breaking down and its properties changing. Yeah. Now, in the sense. wild, like, dead leaves and things would collect around the base of an orchid, and some orchids even grow aerial roots that are specifically designed to capture that detritus. Mm -hmm. But, like you're saying, rain washes it away. Like, when they're, yeah. when the degradation is high enough that it might suffocate the roots, that, like, it just washes away from the plant. Yeah. And when you're growing them in a pot, that's not going to happen very much. And so, yeah, it's, it's not how the plant is used to being grown. Um, so that's why it's important to repot them semi-regularly. Mm -hmm. Now, for some orchids, they hate having their roots bothered. And to bother the roots of some orchids means that you're setting it back years because it's going to need to reestablish. Some of them don't want to even think about blooming unless they are like securely in position. And a Phalaenopsis doesn't really tend to be like that. But if you're growing something like a Vanda that is going to hate having its roots disturbed, you might just want to use like broken clay shards or expanded clay pellets or something that uh, isn't going to hold um like tons of water but enough and it's never going to break down so when the plant outgrows the pot you can just put like the whole thing in a bigger pot and you don't have to worry about any of the breakdown of material that would suffocate the roots Okay, so this is a little bit more of an advanced topic, it sounds like, that we're yeah. kind of yeah, like, alluding to. When I was a kid, I used to go visit the UW Botanical Greenhouse, and their grower um, definitely had, uh, like, a huge collection of orchids, and the way that they grew basically all of them was in pots of broken shards wow. um if they were potted orchids they had a lot mounted too so this is like a shard of a terracotta pot yep right? yeah like yeah. broken pots you just bust them up into some regular sized pieces That's so interesting yeah. yeah and that way like the plant can securely hold itself in place but it's never going to have its roots rot because it's the clay will stay that way. Yeah, it will never really break down. Okay, and the terracotta yeah. pellets you're talking about, I think many of us have seen these at Ikea, right? Yeah. Like you can get these kind of like these little brown balls. That they look just like cocoa puffs. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, oh, and they're wow. used in um, hydroponics, but I also use them uh, pretty readily to augment... Uh, soil mixes for yeah. epiphytes and I've even potted some plants just purely in them and from what I can tell it's been successful I'll report back if I start having you know losses of plants that are grown this way but for now it's great okay but yeah for the, maybe for a beginner this is tangential for now yeah right? this will, this exists <laughs> we will get back to this yes. topic at some future yeah. date okay. um but the one at hand right now you have this phalaenopsis that's just like bare roots and what are you going to do with it um, we'll talk about how to pot it and also how to mount it. Basically, when you're potting, you want to find the smallest pot that the root system can, like, fit in comfortably. You don't want to go too large because if you don't have enough roots to fill a space, the substrate will stay wetter longer, which contributes to breakdown of oh, the yeah. substrate. But more importantly and more relevantly, the roots may suffer because they're not able to use the amount of water that's around them. And a lot of orchids also tend to bloom better if they're on like a smaller potted scale. Mm -hmm. So, and that's true of a lot of plants. So you wanna find, it could even be the same pot that you started in or one that's just slightly larger, but you wanna make sure that the roots that you can sit the plant in the empty pot so that the lowest leaves are basically at the same level as the top of the pot. And then the roots aren't mashed or coiled too much to fit inside. This is why I trim long roots because I don't really like them to be like coiled up wildly on the inside just to scrunch the plant in. Um, but you don't really need to stress it that much as long as the plant can sit comfortably. Yeah, and this is a great, it's kind of a great thing to call out. So yeah, you know, you took this out, you swished it or whatever, you clipped off dead things. 
it could very well just fit super well into that same pot. Yeah, right? there's no reason not out, to use it again. Yeah, you took out the breaking down or this broken down bark. I mean, so the plant is going to be happy. It's like, oh, whoa, all this brand new medium that I like. Okay, there's plenty of room in here. Yeah. Okay, and you're just encouraging out. it you're to not, grow lots of new roots. Yeah, not, you know, it's necessarily need a bigger pot. Yeah, um, it's better to not go with a bigger pot unless the plant needs the bigger pot. So what you're going to do then is um, I usually with one hand kind of hold the plants in place by the crown between the leaves and then I'll just add small handfuls of the substrate and as I go I just kind of tuck them in around the roots to make sure that there aren't any large air pockets. It's fine if you have some but you want to make sure that it's securely in place. There's nothing holding the orchid in place at this point because its roots are all detached from the pot and the substrate. So it's going to grow the healthiest roots if it's not wobbling around. So use the substrate as you're potting to make sure that it's secure and fairly wobble free. Um, I'll use like a bamboo stake to even kind of poke the, the substrate around and like tamp it into place as I go. Okay. But you're never like pressing it down, you wouldn't say. You're not like... No, like... You're just... Yeah, you don't want it to be like super, super compact. You're going to find like this nice medium spot of like, I've got all the holes mm -hmm. filled, the roots are all secure. Secure, but there's still maybe a little bit of those like that airiness that we talked yeah. about, right? The exercise is not to get as much substrate in the pot as possible. It's to make sure that the plant is like comfortably positioned. Um, when when you have the the substrate up to the top of the pot, don't cover any of the leaves. Go right up to the bottom of the lowest leaf. And then if you've left that flower spike on, one of the other good reasons to have done that is that you now have a way to stake the plant. If it's wobbling a bit, just add a bamboo stake carefully. Try to avoid smashing roots that you've just carefully potted. And tie the flower spike to that stake in order to stabilize it. As they grow their new roots, they're extremely fragile. They have bright green growing tips and they bruise and damage very easily. So you wanna make sure that you are as gentle with these as possible. And if your orchid already has growing roots when you repot, you might even just take some damp sphagnum moss and kind of like gently like pad them as you're tucking the soil or the, the substrate around just to avoid damaging them because they'll stop growing and then that root will, it won't die, but it won't grow anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, protect any new bright green uh, growth tips that you have. You'll start seeing those sprout out within a few weeks of potted if you're lucky. You'll want to kind of keep it on the drier side of moist for the first few weeks after your first initial water. Like when you pot it, water it thoroughly, but then keep it a little bit like close to dry without actually drying out because you want the roots to see that they need to grow to get water. Oh, okay. Um, you're gonna encourage it to start throwing out tons of new roots by limiting the amount of water that the plant has. Hmm. Um, it sounds kind of paradoxical and you also don't want it to dry completely. So like find that little balance for yourself. Mm -hmm. But then once you see active new, new root growth or a new leaf poking out, just resume watering like normal. Um, I don't want to give you like some water every three days because yeah. Or yeah. Or maybe if you just, just think to yourself, all right, this is not the typical plant that, oh, I've just put it in the ground. I better give it a lot of extra water for a while. Yeah. It's not like that. Right? Yeah. So this is a anything, plant a that less. just keep it humid um, because it'll appreciate the humidity more than it will the moisture around the roots until the roots have grown well. So the reason that I'm not going to give like water every three days is because that's not going to mean the same thing to you as it does me. Uh, in our individual growing spaces. If you have a really humid apartment like mine, uh, you're gonna be good. If you have a drier apartment like everybody else, just keep an eye on it. You can increase the humidity around the orchid by setting the pot on like a shallow bowl or a deep tray of gravel. And what you can do is water the orchid, let that water drain into the gravel, but the pot's not sitting in it. And so as that 
excess water evaporates, it creates a little bit of a humid environment. You can also group plants together because if you have like a little cluster of plants mm -hmm. in a corner, they'll retain more humidity than if you just have it sitting out in the open in the middle of your living room. Um, you can also mist them a couple of times a day. They'll always appreciate that. But the substrate should ideally never quite dry, but not stay wet for too long. So just kind of figure out what that routine looks like for you. Now, you are going to hopefully get this to rebloom. That's sort of the whole point. And most Phalaenopsis will do this once or twice a year. And they'll do it more faithfully if you give them the brightest and direct light that you can provide. They like to be kept warm, like around 75 to 85 degrees during the day, and cool off to 60 to 65 degrees at night, which can be a little cool for some homes, but they're not going to be too bothered if it stays warmer than that. For many orchids, blooming is actually triggered by a dry, cool season, and if your Phalaenopsis doesn't bloom within the next year, you can try to trigger that by letting her dry slightly more between waterings, maybe even get bone dry for like one day and then water again quickly, um, and keep her on the cooler side for a couple of months, because this might be the signal that it's time to bloom then. Yeah, like if you leave any door or window open at night, I mean, I think in many places it can get a little cooler at night, and that yeah. seems to help some people, at least, I guess at least around Seattle where that's a lot more consistent, but... Even if you just grow the plant near a window, that might be enough. Okay. Yeah. Now, the flower spike will initially look a lot like a root, but the root has a little bit more transparency to it, and you'll know what those look like after you've seen a couple. And the flower spike will come out from the side of the stem through the leaves, just like the roots, but it'll pretty quickly um, appear to not be a root because it'll have like a little node uh, and then a little bud and then it'll grow another stretch of, of a stem between nodes. And you'll, you'll know that it's a flower spike fairly soon. And you want to be very gentle with this. You can damage it and then it won't flower. Uh, but basically, like, if you get that far, you're golden. You can get them a little bit more likely to flower by fertilizing them regularly. But one of the typical orchid adages is weekly, weekly, spelled W-E-A-K. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then, so like a weak amount of fertilizer every time you water. That's about a quarter strength of a balanced uh, commercial fertilizer. To be honest, I don't fertilize mine a ton. It is better to do small amounts consistently than large amounts irregularly or, mm. um, you know, large amounts heavily will damage them. And there's a lot of, you know, fertilizers available that are for orchids. Right, yeah. As well. Now, I don't think that's necessarily important. I think that there's a lot of um, marketing that goes into that that just isn't really necessary to uh, to do. I mostly use Miracle Grow liquid fertilizer, the balanced formula, or the Bloom Boosting one, which has more phosphorus in it. Um, but basically, like, just give your plants a little bit of food occasionally, and they'll be happy for it. So. We talked about how some orchids really hate having their roots disturbed, and some of them also really dislike having them in pots. Like, the Phalaenopsis is going to do well. It'll be fine and happy. But for some plants, having any amount of enclosure like that is really damaging. They'll rot very readily. They will really fail to thrive. So that's when you would instead choose to mount an orchid. And by mounting it, you're basically reproducing how they grow in the wild by giving it an area to stretch out its roots, secure the plant, grow and bloom from that position. And Stephen actually has a few mounted orchids right now um, that are doing beautifully. His Brazzavola nidosa is mounted on a piece of driftwood. And he is very good about keeping them watered enough. But one of the biggest challenges with growing a mounted orchid is that they dry very quickly. And if you're in an 85% humidity jungle that rains several times a day, that's totally fine. Like that's mm -hmm. exactly how the plant is designed to grow. But if we're in a 40% humidity apartment, 
you're going to want to water very regularly. And for a plant that likes water as much as a Phalaenopsis, that could mean daily during hot weather and yeah. at least weekly in cold weather. Uh, so that's kind of something that if you want to take on that challenge, just keep in mind that it is a challenge. The plant will be very happy that way as long as you treat it well and keep the humidity high. Yeah, so I think you're right. There's the challenge to that is definitely keeping up the watering. I think it it makes some things easier, right? Like I never really worry about overwatering. I well because you, know, you can't. Of, yeah, <laughs> you really can't, right? Yeah. Um, I feel like I guess I feel like there are certain other benefits. Like I can control the light a little bit better because I can just hang this on something, right? I'm like, oh, I want to boom this a little bit closer to the light. Well, I can just you know. Put some hook on something and it, I think there's some some uh, leeway that, that you get there I mean for me I really try to spray it every day and the nice thing about that is it, it takes I don't know five seconds right I don't have to okay pick up the thing get the water in a cup and, and really in some ways it's, it's faster but I just have to remember to kind of do it like every day it's kind of like making my coffee if you can put it in your routine then um, you know I think you can get there but really you can't you know, I found I can't have too many either. So I think I have four right now, or maybe five. I see like six mountain orchids. One, two, three, oh, four. Oh, yeah. Five, and, and then even one of those I have in a cup, which is, a, I guess, another thing we can talk about some other time. But, like, yeah, it's something that I feel like I would, I would have something in a pot if I did, uh, if I got you know, many more from here. Anyway. Yeah. But the thing with mounted orchids that's really cool is being able to see them grow in their wild, like natural, uh, inclination. And like I mentioned with Phalaenopsis, they usually grow with their, with their growth point facing downwards because this keeps water from collecting. Uh, it's not going to be raining in your apartment, hopefully. So that's not something that you have to observe, but over time the plant will orient itself in that direction. It'll kind of flop over as it grows new leaves and that stem length increases. Uh, so it, it's just a cool way to do it. Now, it sounds like this is a really like tricky, challenging uh, thing to do, but it's really simple. It's easier than potting. You take some sphagnum moss, the long fiber stuff, you find an appropriate mount, which is going to be something that is durable and resistant to rot. So some of the most common ones are like driftwood or cork bark. Um, you can buy sheets of cork, just natural, that have deep furrows in them. And orchids love to kind of squeeze their roots between the little fissures and mm -hmm. valleys and, yeah. and cork bark. You can also buy plaques of fir bark, um, like you would use chopped up in a pot uh, and one of my favorites is actually just cedar planks like you'd use for fencing because cedar is naturally rot resistant so what you're going to want to do is take the sphagnum moss put a small amount of it in the root ball so that the root ball has some moisture available and then get the crown of the plant as close to that uh, that mounting surface as you're going to use because you want the roots to be able to grow directly towards the mount rather than into the sphagnum. Now, some orchids don't want any amount of sphagnum. Some of them like a lot. And Phalaenopsis, because they like to stay fairly moist, they're one that's going to want more. So put a little bit within the root ball, get it on the mount where you want, and then add more sphagnum on top to kind of cover the roots and provide some moisture for them. You're going to then tie it on to this mount and some people like fishing line because it is thin and clear so it's less noticeable. I personally like jute because it is natural. You can still see it but it blends in a little bit and it'll break down over time which some people don't like. Um, but for my growing experience, the plant is usually established well enough by the time um, the jute breaks down. So then the plant is holding itself on and you don't have to worry about it. The key with this is to water it well, water it often, and after a few weeks you should start seeing some new roots grow in. Now, because this is kind of a topic that's better to look at, we're actually going to be, after we record this episode, we're going to be filming a little tutorial about both how to mount and how to plant uh, orchids in pots. 
it'll be quick, but it'll be a good accompaniment so that you can kind of see what we're talking about. So basically, this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to orchids and their care. We've only really focused on Phalaenopsis, the most common one that you're going to encounter. And there's enough interest in orchids, I think, that we're probably going to revisit it again. Talk about some of the discovery of these South American Catalia orchids that we talked about earlier that sent Europe into a frenzy for the exotic species. We're going to talk about how to grow some of the more specialized ones. And Stephen and I both have enough interesting, like, rare, unique, special orchids that we'll definitely want to focus on some of those in particular. Uh, but we're going to save that for another episode. Um, but yeah, any closing thoughts, Stephen? Uh, well, thanks for putting all this together, for one. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, even if you have, if you have no experience with orchids, uh, if you're a super experienced plant person, I think the great thing now um, is that, like we were saying earlier, these are so accessible. You can buy some, you know, you, you're probably going to find one that you like, right? Even in your daily life, that's probably like $13, right? Just, you know, it could be fun to take a chance with this. Maybe try mounting, try some kind of crazy setup. I've tried uh, crazy glue, actually, to mount some of these. Apparently this is, you know, doesn't really hurt any of the organic, you know, parts of the, of the orchid. And I had pretty good luck with that. You can try some really interesting setups with different wood, right? I think there's a lot you can do, particularly with mounting and um, in these different mediums. There's actually a Brazzavo Lindendosa that I have. Um, since it's one of Stephen and Mai's favorite orchid, um, I used Chola wood, which is the kind of like woody skeleton of a cactus. And I'm sure that you've seen it. It has a lot of holes in it. Uh, really cool looking wood, but I packed that full of sphagnum moss and then I took a little seedling brazzavola and I tucked a couple of its roots through holes mm -hmm. and a little bit more sphagnum moss over the root ball, tied it in place, and then I set that in a like cocktail tumbler and I just fill it up with water occasionally so that the water absorbs into the sphagnum. And the Brazzavola is loving it. Really? It's thrown yeah. out okay. tons of roots. Right. Yeah, like there's roots. It's not really on. But... Yeah, you, the next time you're over, you should check it out. Um, the roots are growing like in and out of the Cholo wood holes. And it's putting out um, two new growths right now after putting out uh, two when I first mounted it. It's really happy and I'm really excited to see how it blooms. Um, because the one that Stephen has is really beautiful how you just see it exactly how it would look in the wild. Um, I'll show some photos of that as well. And you also see both some photos and also some videos of how we repot and mount these things here. Uh, but yeah, so this has been Plant Daddy Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out our social media that we've just got going. And be sure to take an eye out for the YouTube tutorial that we're going to be posting on these orchid care things that we've been discussing. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, we'll be back soon. 